Namaste, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's here. I wish you all a very happy International Labor Day. And I know it's a day of solidarity amidst uh, the, the public service employees as they have their strike here in, in Canada. Uh, a hearty welcome to all of you. We've got two, two very experienced and uh, very well-known uh, feminists with us and who I'm, I'm going to introduce in a little while. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm here in Antigonish, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq community. It's also, uh, they, they are the indigenous people here. And uh, it's also the territory of the African Nova Scotians. And, and uh, I pay all my respect to them. I also want to tell you that I come from Bhopal in India, which is one of the biggest known sites of, the, of, of a very, very uh, corporate genocide, which was committed with impunity in 1984. And that led to the death of about uh, 3,500 people one night, and we still suffer uh, about two decades uh, after, after this, the gas leak that happened because of a corporate factory. So um, I, I want to welcome everyone on this webinar. And I want to begin by asking a question as to why is it that on an International Labor Day, we're talking about transnational feminist networks. And uh, you know that May 1 commemorates the International Workers uh, Day or the Labor Day. And this, this is how uh, it, this led to, to the workers' demand for an eight hours of work, working day. But on this note, I want to draw your attention to the fact that 50% of the population, mostly gendered and racialized population, continues to work. And, and, and by work, I, I mean to say what is not even considered productive labor in a very, very capitalist patriarchal world. So they continue to work around the clock. And ILO estimates say that they work for as many as 16 to 19 hours a day. So uh, women and racialized bodies and most precarious bodies continue to be involved in both paid and unpaid work. And that's the reason why we are here. Because for us, feminism is not just about a homogeneous category called women. We're, we're going to break it down quite a bit and we're going to look at it in, in the perspective of precarious bodies. So, on, on this day, we have chosen this particular issue to critically reflect <clears throat> on, on how we continue to undervalue women's labor and the labor of precarious bodies, and not just that, invisibilize it. So what we're going to do is not just visibilize it, but also amplify it today. And we know that <clears throat> in a global capitalist regime, you know, you has led to formulation of bodies like special economic zones where no labor laws prevail. You know, it's led to the withdrawal of social security and, and contracts. It's led to squalid conditions of work for the most vulnerable people. And, and, and some of the examples, you know, very recent ones as, as I go back were Rana Plaza in Bangladesh where thousand garment workers died in a fire and, and they were living in, in, a very, in very squalid conditions, standing and working. A recent study in electronic factory in Vietnam says that Vietnamese women had, had absolutely no contracts and they were made to stand for the eight to 12 hours where, where they worked and subjected to high levels of noise. A recent study in Cambodia garment factory says that pregnancy can be the only reason to get you fired. As in when we struggle and talk about maternity rights and maternity leave. So there's enhanced precarity of women and many, many other vulnerable racialized bodies. And that's not just in factories. We know <clears throat> women are involved in very monotonous, low paying, low prestige jobs. 
And most women work in unorganized sectors. So whether they could be domestic workers, landless labor, and, are, and subject to a whole range of abuses and the sheer monotony and the physical confinement are cruel to say the least. And that's why we want to reiterate today that we stand in solidarity against a very capitalist, patriarchal and racialized regime, which exacerbates the existing gender, the class, the racialized inequality, and it adds further to the historical inequalities. Women and racialized people feed into these value chains, and we know a lot of us engage with value chains as cheap labor. So this holy grail of you know, export-led <clears throat> FDI attracting, please forgive me for my sniffles. <clears throat> I have COVID and, and can be a little uh, off the track at times. The, so this holy grail of export-led FDI attracting economic growth has coerced states to reduce protection, curtail wages, criminalize people who, who you know, and, and we've seen many of these uprisings, but we know that criminalization of worker uprising is something that's happening a lot, but workers are rising everywhere. And uh, apart from the last thing that I want to say that apart from a cyclical economy, which I know a lot of people are talking about, a lot of economists have now started talking about a purple economy, and which is an economic order around uh, sustainability of caring you know, a caring labor, which is essentially the work of, of precarious people and, and women. <clears throat> so I, I want to begin today as we celebrate the International Labor Day and mindful of the women workers who continue to be invisibilized. And I, I want to reiterate that what we started with of what was going to be the eight hours of work for women and for many other decolonized or racialized bodies, it still remains a far-fetched dream. And that's something that we are going to discuss today. Discuss it from a very strong feminist perspective. I, I want to begin by welcoming the two guests we have today, both of them very close to my heart. I want to begin by welcoming Abha Bhaiya who is a founder, trustee, and executive director of Jagori Rural Charitable Trust. It evolved out of the feminist movement in India. And uh, Abha is not just one of the, the founder trustees. She, in a lot of ways, is the face of the feminist movement and elder, as we say in indigenous jargon. And uh, <clears throat> she has been a part of many policies, many policy formulations, and is a very, very well-known mentor and a trainer across South Asia. And I take a lot of pride in saying that Abha is one of my mentors as well. Abha, would you like to introduce yourself? Mm. You have said enough. Um, I've been in the feminist movement, or women's movement to begin with for nearly last five decades. So it's a long journey. And for me, the, the entire issue of becoming a feminist uh, that I would talk a little later has been my own life experiences and experiences of other women who I feel very strongly connected to. And as you said, that women are not a monolithic category. There are multiple identities that we have been subjected to uh, and we need to really work against it. Uh, my life has been uh, quickly. I have been born in a little, uh, in a family that was basically rather conservative. So I rose against it, and I feel I'm I'm a born feminist because I kept it in many different ways. So that, that's what has led me to understand the pain of it and the pain that I also carried inside me. Uh, I have worked on multiple themes and issues. Uh, in different contexts, not only in South Asia, but also in international uh, kind of uh, arena, um, countries in Africa, countries in Europe, and also in the in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So that's it. I think uh, that should be enough to begin with. I'm so glad that we are talking together on this particular day 
and the way you have unfolded the entire issue reminds me of a recent uh, kind of a cryptic WhatsApp message that I've just left my office, I've left my work to start my work, which means going back home and it is double, triple burden that women carry and do not complain often. I think today they reminds us that that's something that we continuously struggle against and bring this entire issue of exploitation of women's labor as central to our concern and bring women together as solidarity action group. That would be my dream. And not only say happy Labor Day once a year, but throughout the year. Thank you, Abha. Thank you so much. The other distinguished guest we have today is Nancy. Welcome, Nancy. And Nancy has been such a source of strength all through here, all through my trip here. Nancy is a feminist scholar. She is an activist. She is a professor in Women and Gender Studies program at the St. Francis Xavier University, of which Cody Institute is a part of. And, uh, you know, she, she has a whole range of work, starting from transnational feminism to working with Sexual Assault Service Association and, and you know, walks the talk. But I, I want Nancy to also introduce herself in a, a little bit more in detail. Over to you, Nancy. Uh, good morning um, uh, from uh, Antigonish. Um, I, I guess I would say that, um, yeah, that that how I came to to uh, feminism, and in in some respects, um, that uh, being an undergrad, that it it mainly through education. I come from a small town. Uh, north of Toronto uh, in Ontario, Canada, um, and first generation to go to university. Um, and that uh, for me, getting an education was an avenue to becoming aware of women's issues, to becoming aware of feminism and the power of feminism. And that it wasn't just ever enough for me <laughs> to be learning and reading um, and talking about women's issues and feminism, it was really important for me to be engaged in community and being engaged in um, uh, advocating on a variety of feminist related issues, which is what I've done. I haven't been involved uh, for quite the amount of time that ABBA has, but still uh, 35 years in, and that uh, it's it's been central not just to my work life but my community life, um, and my home life. And that I would also say um, that uh, a key issue that um, I have long been interested in um, are labor issues related to women. And one of the things that's really striking, and I'm hoping that we'll explore hear more, and I think that the nice connection between Abba and myself is uh, as someone who comes from the global north, who's someone who has benefited from higher education in the global north and even been engaged in feminist activism in Canada as part of the global north, um, both what that means for uh, uh, being in this location, but but how that's also impacted uh, feminist issues more generally. So, and I, I think that that one of the things that's been really striking uh, to me and to others uh, in the wake of COVID is the way in which it has visibilized, and not so much for me, but for others of the enormous care work that women are involved in, both paid and unpaid. And the way in which, and a country like Canada relies upon migrant women workers and is drawing ever more migrant women workers uh, into Canada um, in a way that's often exploitative uh, as far as even the process of migration and the kinds of work that they are employed in while they're here. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, if that, yeah. Thank you so much. That, that, that was a strong one. Last but not the least, I want to welcome Brian and all the attendees here. Thank you so much for having taken out the time. 
we want to keep it very interactive. So please do not hesitate in asking any question that you might have. So how we're planning to go about the next 90 minutes or actually the 70 minutes now is maybe for the first 40, 45 minutes, we'll have a, a series of questions around which we want both Abha and Nancy to respond. If you have questions on that, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And then we're just going to open it up uh, for people to ask questions and for, for all of us to, to ponder over these questions. We're not saying necessarily that we have the answers. So to begin, uh, Abha, I want to start with you. Why is there a need to talk about feminism? As long as patriarchy continues internationally and nationally to dominate all institutions, I think we will need feminisms and multiple feminisms to actually rise against the, the patriarchal control of women's life. And as you said, the labor of women, the care that women provide, care economy, as we call it. Uh, all those issues are so pertinent and I've seen them at such close quarters that I feel in order to really challenge patriarchy and all other forms of kind of oppression, which is, includes capitalism, it includes militarization, it includes really the entire system of privatized economic uh, systems that oppress the majority of women and men. Uh, we need a, a kind of ideological perspective that is based on the understanding of the oppression and exploitation and exclusion of people, as well as activism to really take the ideological perspective into, into activism and onto the streets. So for me, feminism is about building, uh, building a very complex understanding and also intersectional understanding of the issues facing women and all other all other members in the community that have been denied systematically and systemic through systematic oppression that need to actually stand and really say we demand our rights as a citizen and as a human being. So that would be my starting point. And for me, there are many isms like communism, capitalism and X, Y, Z, socialism. I think why feminism is closest to me because it challenges all forms of oppression and exclusion. And it is an evolving perspective. We haven't arrived. We don't say we know everything. And also that is an amalgamation of multiple feminisms. So we do not have, we have something in common, definitely, and that is patriarchy. You know, that patriarchal domination inside and outside the home is our major enemy. And how do we fight against it? But we have, you know, so many streams of feminisms. And that's the beauty of it, that under the rubric of feminism nationally and internationally, we can say that we belong to feminisms and not only a single feminist kind of a perspective. Um, for me, you know, what feminism also has brought very close to my heart because I feel I'm an artist at heart. You know, I'm, I'm an activist, I'm a trainer, but I'm also someone who believes in aesthetics of communities, aesthetics of our kind of inner world and outer world. And as you know, I've tried to create, uh, we need art and activism together. So celebration of our multiple identities, one part of the feminist kind of a struggle, discrimination, oppression. And the other side is the feminist struggle yourself within your own private life and also in the public arena. So feminism is also something that allows me to reformulate it seems to be I feel the need for feminism. Oh, 
Abba, this is Brian. Abba, this is Brian. You're starting to freeze up a little bit, so I'm going to suggest that you turn your camera off and save some bandwidth and just, just talk to us. Thank you very much. Close to camera? Yes, this is much better, Abba. Okay, the sound is much better. So yes. I would say that the uh, evolving critique of patriarchal institution, patriarchal mindset, uh, patriarchal domination and power struggle and actually distributing all kinds of inequalities is the challenge that feminist movement has taken up as its central concern. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'll just in the end say it's a very comprehensive vision. In fact, according to me, the departure uh, from women's movement to feminist movement is something that we need to talk about and why we are calling ourselves feminists. And why are we saying we are part of the feminist movement and not the women's movement? But I'll come to it later. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abba. Nancy? I could listen to Abba all day. Um, uh, so thank you uh, for that, uh, Abba. Um, I, I think that, that I would say that feminism um, and feminisms, as Abba uh, indicated, um, are needed uh, more than ever before, that the kinds of analyses oh. of uh, discrimination and oppression, of advocating for rights while also um, making clear ongoing wrongs has been central to um, uh, feminist thought and action for a very long time. And uh, that uh, for me that uh, the very fact that, and we now use the, the sort of uh, uh, terminology of intersectionality, which again has been around for some time, not always necessarily used by that term, um, but which acknowledges the, the intersection of various forms of inequality and hierarchical social systems, which impact uh, 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 women, men, uh, et cetera, is, has been just one of the, the really major contributions of, of feminism um, for some time. And I think that, that related to that is, um, how would I put it? Is that, um, is that, that employing that kind of analysis has been useful um, and hugely insightful and hugely motivating to understanding um, and advocating around gender-based violence, about economic inequality, uh, about uh, uh, a whole range of really important around the environment and climate, around militarization and, and peace. And that, that um, it isn't that all feminists focus on all of those issues simultaneously, that as Abba was saying, that there are a multiplicity of feminisms, that there are a multiplicity of issues that different feminists have focused on, that that in, in some ways, you know, comes together uh, in, in and, and sometimes not coming together, I would also say at the same time, um, in terms of addressing rights and, and wrongs. The other thing I would say, and I, I'm not artistic, so uh, uh, in the way that Abba was describing this and feminism in terms of the aesthetics of it, but, but I would talk about feminism as being life affirming and joyful, that connecting with other people um, in uh, uh, brainstorming and thinking about strategies and even coming up with not my own art, but, but um, poster making is is a creative enterprise in which I have to say and on the number of marches which have been more than a few that I've been involved in that the creativity of of others uh, continues to inspire me and that uh, uh, I could name any number of moments in which the sheer joy of seeing um, the the commitment of others to seeking justice is is something which 
uh, continues to motivate me in a whole variety of different ways. If that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, one thing that really rang is the multiplicity of feminisms that you both have been talking about and also the recognition of, of multiple factors of oppression, you know. So as in when we talk about the left progressive movement, we're aware that class is the base. But if you look at feminism, they have tried incorporating class, race, gender, colonization, and a whole series of other factors. And I love the fact, Nancy, that you talk about dissent as a basic right, you know, the right to dissent, the, the freedom of movement of association, you know, which is something that's that we don't see in the current democratic world and democracy itself you know, under quotes. So thank you so much. Um, I'm very really tempted to move from here because both of you started very on a very personal note when you were introducing yourself. What have been your own experiences with the feminist movement? And uh, I again want to start with Abha. Hmm. You know, being a uh, kind of a very, very integral architect of the feminist movement in, in India, I personally feel that the feminist movement, I have, I've been shaped by it, and I have in return shaped it. So I see a very kind of interactive relationship between the movement and me. Uh, what I have actually, un what I could not understand as I was growing up as a girl, as a woman, uh, why all these discriminatory practices were going on. And the fact that I started reading, and as Nancy said, you know, I was in Germany when I was 20, 20, uh, 21, and I got a chance to read many black feminist writers, uh, you know, some them on the Bois for the first time. I met a lot of feminist singer, I met feminist, uh, I mean, uh, activist in terms of the students. And there were so many moments going on at the moment that I learned and absorbed a lot from that and made it my own. And it actually, when I came back, I became a feminist. And I realized I was born feminist, I was protesting, but becoming a feminist after learning the struggles of other women in different contexts uh, brought home the understanding of lives of women in my own home and in my vicinity, as well as in the larger context of women's women's struggle, it it really was something that made me a very political person, and gave me a tool to analyze every situation from a feminist lens. To be honest, and feminist lens is not about, as you said, the labor woman. It will talk about the class, but for us, feminism also meant men recognizing how many systems of oppression and domination exist within a cultural political context. For example, you are talking about racialized body. For me, casteist bodies, you know, in, in the Indian context, the caste system, the class issue, the gender, multiple gender identity, the sexual identity, the bodies that are actually special bodies with all kinds of disability, and, you know, the kind of identities such as sex workers, the identity as women, women, uh, uh, you would know better um, because in Madhya Pradesh, it still exists women who carry the, um, the human, human fecus matter on their heads, you know, because of their caste background, because of no option. That makes me really feel strongly that feminism is the answer because we are raising issue of each and every woman, particularly the most oppressed, the most kind of excluded and the ones who have never been part of the larger human rights movement. So feminism answers that. Uh, I became, uh, and you know, my journey began with the Matra rape case that happened in, so in 70s, early 70s, and the Ramizabi case, the, the gang rape uh, in the police station. And these were custodial rapes. And that's where we started rising and coming out of the streets. And that is a very powerful experience to come out on the streets with other women and say, this is not acceptable. This is something that we need to fight against and demand justice. 
And that's where we began. And then we moved into forming what we called autonomous women's groups and collectives based on the notion of, you know, no hierarchies, a collective process, discussion, dialogue, conversation, and also starting from the, the entire slogan, the personal is political. So nothing should remain outside the purview of our concern. And, you know, patriarchal and capitalist divide between the private and the public was something that we started breaking down and into smaller pieces and saying this divide is again not acceptable to us because whatever happens inside the private sphere has a political implication, has a wider public implication. When a child sees a mother being beaten, a boy or a girl, for a boy, the message is clear, women should be beaten. And for a girl, that women should be beaten is normalized. So how do you make it not normal? How do you create an understanding and awareness? So a lot of work was about street plays, uh, street demonstration, uh, music. I mean, I can't tell you in India and South Asia, the feminist music has really been very, very important to build solidarity, to sing on streets. And we did it on based on folk music. So all the women in villages could sing those songs. And that's again a political kind of strategy to bring women together and say, uh, say and express the pain of women, the right, uh, rights of women, also to actually bring the agency of women forward into the movement. So for me, this journey continued. We started with autonomous women's group, and then gradually I felt the need to reach out to rural hinterland and take the feminist movement into the rural the areas. So I, we started working with rural women's um, NGOs in the rural area where women had no voice. They were dominated by male uh, directors. And that's where we started actually doing what we call uh, I kind of uh, getting inside the hearts and the pulse of the people's organization and what women had as terms of rights and how they were exploited there and spreading women's consciousness. And I must say one thing, majority of the women at the time when I started in rural areas had no access to literacy. So the major challenge was, how do you build this awareness and consciousness with women who cannot read and write? And that for me became a, a kind of very important area to actually look at literature and awareness uh, kind of building processes in non-literate formats, like making posters, like doing street plays, music, theater, and also a conversation uh, that are kind of evolved between among women and they describing their own realities. And the actual, actual, destruction of their individualities through the processes of, of oppression, uh, that itself became a ground for, for our education, as I said. Nancy's talked about different kind of education. But this education was very empowering. And to be honest, till today, my gurus have been these women without literacy skills, but amazing wisdom, amazing courage, and also gave me very different strategies that were not about uh, revenge, not about kind of protest, but saying there are different ways of actually addressing issues within the cultural context. You cannot leave your home, but how do you create possibilities to actually challenge inequalities within those homes? This journey has been continuous. Sarika, you talked about the Bhopal guest uh, tragedy. We were there for one month. We slept on the roadside of railway tracks. We did plays. We actually started taking women to hospitals. So feminist movement has been actually concerned about each and every issue of women's and men's lives. So we have not excluded anybody. In the beginning, we were not aware of it, I must admit. But gradually, as other groups of people started rising, and talking about their concerns, we realized that 
mainstream feminist movement now must integrate these different streams and different identity-based uh, political formation of women into the women's movement. And that has enriched the feminist movement. We have been out there in refugee camps when 3,000 men, sick men were murdered in Delhi and we had to be kind of part. And there I must say one thing, how we have shifted the narratives uh, as feminists. Like when dowry deaths issue came up in the women's movement and we were faced with it, and the media, the families, the state, all were talking about dowry deaths. And the feminists rose up and said, these are not deaths, these are murders. Just renaming. And that renaming has been very, very central and integral to how women have actually evolved their own, own concepts and political naming uh, in terms of how we define the, the actually hidden politics of an identity. Maybe I'll stop here and come back on, on kind of my, my engagement in the feminist movement. Thank you, Abba. Thank you. Oh, Nancy, over to you. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I, I would say that um, I've been involved in a number of issues at the, the national level, although not as a, it nearly as extensive as ABBA, that a lot of my feminist activism and engagement has been at a local grassroots level. Um, and, and at least in part, uh, or in a large part of it, um, dealing with gender-based violence, um, and even more specifically than that, sexualized uh, violence. And um, I, I certainly would say that I, I have ben benefited from and, and uh, take um, uh, great inspiration from the fact that, that uh, I've been part of several generations of feminists that have been able to create services to bring awareness, uh, to attempt to formulate various forms of, of um, uh, prevention and accountability around uh, gender-based violence um, that has really made a, a significant difference, although uh, gender-based violence continues to be pervasive and problematic um, in the communities in which I live and across Canadian society and with particular uh, groups of women, most notably Indigenous uh, women uh, and girls being particularly vulnerable um, to that form of, of um, violence. Um, and I, I think that, that uh, the juxtaposition, you know, between that and, and that activism being, and I started out um, as uh, in my 20s, working on a crisis line as part of a, a sexual assault crisis center that was uh, operated entirely by people as, as uh, volunteers, and then mobilized into, was there, um, and uh, uh, in a, another city, uh, Kingston, Ontario, where I, I, uh, I didn't know even that I could do this, but I gave a speech for Take Back the Night, which is uh, uh, an event held in Canada across the country uh, to bring awareness to uh, sexualized uh, violence. And it was um, at that time that I, it, it was a process of gaining confidence. I've always been outspoken, sort of like I've, I've always been in some ways aware of um, uh, forms of uh, gender and other forms of discrimination and not been reticent to speak out about that. But the fact that I could do so publicly um, and that I could be part of a larger conversation um, was, was really uh, quite uh, important and significant and have been involved and in, for um, almost uh, three decades uh, with the Women's Center in Antigonish, which uh, is an extraordinary place, which offers both services and programs and does community-based research on a wide variety of, of different projects that really does make uh, a different a difference in people's lives, um, um, women, girls, and their families. Um, at the same time, and and I would I would uh, say 
Um, and I'm certainly well aware of my uh, positionality as a cisgendered, uh, straight, now educated woman, although I grew up working class, um, is that um, while there's been an analysis and understanding of multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination, the degree to which women's movements in Canada have really taken up those insights and really meaningfully uh, sought to be more inclusive and to formulate their policies in a way which did not center white women and especially white educated women has been enormously slow uh, to occur. And I would say, I, I went to my first anti-racist workshop in 1988 and uh, uh, that was uh, life changing for me. It was, uh, um, it, it was important in so many ways, but the degree to which being within feminist organizations, and I say that both at the local, regional and national level, and even how Canadian feminists uh, um, are uh, uh, engaging in, in you know, transnational networks is absolutely framed by a kind of res you know, reticence, a kind of purposeful overlooking and obscuring of, of forms of uh, other forms of inequity. And um, it's a, I, I, I'm both inspired by the criticality of feminism and feminisms, and at the same time that there's a recognition of uh, lack of adequate inclusion and diversity but how that's actually brought about has been enormously slow to actually take place. The other thing that I would say, and this also relates to what um, Abba was saying around the, the rural context is, and for me, it's it's been interesting that uh, when I was growing up in this small town north of you know the large metropolitan city of Toronto, it was like, I gotta get out of here, gotta get out of this small town. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, got a fairly, you know, uh, extensive education, and where did I end up? In a small town again, you know, and thinking in some ways, and let me just quickly say that when I first came to Anaganish, I was like, oh my God, I'm coming, you know, and had been involved in various uh, uh, and diverse social movements, and not just around feminism, but around labor and student politics and other things, and then to come to, to Anaganish, I was like, oh, this is, this is, uh, how am I going to adapt, you know, um, at this sort of city slicker and, and learning quite quickly, one, um, the, the <laughs> enormous uh, uh, wisdom and excellent strategizing of, of feminists who were involved in, in the women's community here in Antigonish. And at the same time that the recognition um, that was not slow is <laughs> dawning on me is that, that many feminist uh, issues, strategies, and policies are in some ways, and certainly in Canada and elsewhere, formulated within an urban context, mainly by people living in urban areas. And the nature of women's lives, the, the issues that they deal with, are really quite different in a rural context. And, um, and, and recognizing that um, was really important, that for me, something like transportation. Transportation is a feminist issue. If you can't get to services that are mainly in urban centers, what does it mean? Uh, even to get to town, even to get anywhere, uh, is just a quick example of, of that. Um, and, and the way in which um, that to advocate and one of the, the really, um, I, I would say almost not extraordinary, but 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 uh, noteworthy aspects of of this women's center created here in a somewhat conservative town, um, uh, in in some respects, is creating a multiplicity of services and programs because you can't get to the big city necessarily easily. Then it's important to provide women's services and healthcare and other things um, as as. Uh, um, as as being uh, really crucial, and I, I think that 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 has been um, important in a whole variety of other ways. I think I talked enough. I'll, I'll end it there. I could go on, but yes. 
I, I could really listen to both of you for a very, very, very long time, probably forever. But I, I want to go back to a question that was raised. But before I do that, for people who do not know, I just want to bring your attention to two cases that Abha spoke about. So Mathura was an indigenous girl who was raped and, and she was raped in police custody. And I propose that the court did not find the policeman guilty because they thought that Mathura was sexually very open. And, and that was the first time that, that the you know, when she talks about people marching on the roads to talk about that this is not done. Ramisa B was the wife of a psycho rickshaw puller. And she was again raped uh, in police custody while her husband was outside and he was beaten up very badly. Uh, so these are two incidences. And while she talks about, while both Nancy and Abha, you know, they question this public and private divide. So when Nancy says that transportation is a very strongly women's issue, you know, it's it's a very strong public issue. So we're not just talking about the domain called home, you know, these four walls and how they both merge and how you have to look at the issue holistically is something that, that you know, that really rang in me. And, and you know, all issues being women's issues, but, but you know, uh, on, on the note of inclusion, you know, because I think, Nancy, you reiterated it. I want to pick up a question raised by Varsha Mehta here. And thank you, Varsha, for coming and raising this question. She says that, uh, you know, many a times people feel that feminists are exclusive. So they only work with women, you know, and they don't want to talk about anyone else. And we know that intersectional feminism is not like that. But I want to hear from the two of you because you spoke a lot about evolving and, and, and growing with the movement itself. What are your views? You also ask what's a good point of entry. So uh, if, if you could both please respond to it, starting from you, Abha. Yeah, um, you know, uh, this is really not true anymore. We began working with women because we were very strongly concerned about what was going on in women's lives. And, uh, but today, as we are declaring every issue is a women's issue, we are very clear. We have stood on street against militarization. We have gone on demonstration, signature campaign against communal violence which doesn't mean only women, it means children, it means men, it means really marginalized community, the minority community. And therefore, I would say that this issue of intersectionality of, of issues has been a central concern of the feminist movement as we evolved into a much larger territory of concerns. Uh, and that evolving has continued. So when we say we work with transgender communities, we are yeah. not talking about women. We are talking about the multiple, multiple and diverse identities that have to be part of the feminist movement and feminist concerns. And the fact that we are talking about the silence of people who have never been able to really speak out and stand for their rights, which also includes men, which includes communities that are kind of ethnic community, communities that are dumped into the, the lowest caste uh, kind of a, uh, demographic sense. Now all those people, whether it's men or women, become the concern of feminist movement. And that's why I feel the feminist movement is so comprehensive. It's actually multifaceted. And it has always evolved to uh, include uh, the issues of exclusion and raise voices against it. So our educational agenda in terms of the feminist education and awareness building is not about only women, not any anymore. Maybe we had to start there. Because in order to start with the most excluded and oppressed group of people, you need to give them voice. You need to shift from them being seen as as victims to shifting them as active agents. Yeah, survivor rather than victim of violence. So those shifts have definitely helped us to see where the victimization is taking place, where the you know, systemic uh, oppression becomes part of the culture and politics of a nation. And that's where we say 
nothing that is based on injustice and exclusion is acceptable. We'll rise, we will protest, we'll, we'll actually not give up till, till we can continue to struggle in solidarity. So today, yesterday was a you know, gay pride parade in Dharamshala for the first time. Mm -hmm. We all were there and it is an amazingly joyous event where people are declaring this is what we are, take it or leave it. Yeah. And I thought that the right now the legal legal conversations, legal battles are going on in courts about marriage uh, among uh, the, among uh, same sex marriage. sexual identity yeah identities that they have a right to marry and they all of them who were in the forefront of the struggle talked about it and I added that you know the right to marry is something that I may not even approve or vouch for because I don't believe in the institution myself but if it's a it's a choice and people want to marry, then of course they have a right, irrespective of their sexual identity, irrespective of their caste background, it, it is irrespective of their gendered fluidities, that that right must exist for each and everyone in a secular democratic nation, yeah, where the constitution has enshrined equality as a very, very important fundamental right. And that right, must be accessible to all. So I personally feel that this is very important. When, you know, we, I, I'm one of the architects of what I call setting up women's courts because the, the existing legal systems in our country are not available to women, are not available to the poor. They are not available to the marginal, to, to the, what I call migrant labor, to very oppressed Dalit communities. So now I felt that what do we do in order to actually create a parallel system where women and men feel comfortable and feel that they are being actually received with sensitivity, care, and a listening capacity. So when we started uh, Women's Court, what we call Nari Adalat, we train local women, the, really even women with no literacy skill to become what we call barefoot lawyers, giving them legal framework, giving them an understanding. We did actually a literacy camp during the, uh, the training to say, okay, this A stand for what? C, what does it stand for? Court. So that's how they learned in Hindi, the entire court language. And these women are such great uh, lawyers on the ground that now in India particularly, majority, almost all organizations have this kind of kind of parallel courts, and they have worked very, very uh, effectively to help women and men to sort out or, or look into the issues of uh, issues of conflict, issue of oppression, issue of throwing throwing women out of the house, or men complaining that women have left them. We think anybody who is facing injustice is integral to feminist movement. And it's our commitment to actually say injustice, exclusion, deprivation, and vulnerabilities are not part of human life. Thank you, Abha. Nancy, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, yeah I, just um, a, a couple of things. Um, I, I think that there's been a longstanding debate about um, uh, 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 the reluctance to identify as a feminist based on the perception of what a feminist is in particular places and spaces. Um, and uh, I think a very legitimate um, reluctance at time uh, for individuals and groups of people to identify as feminist based on um, um, perceived deficiencies with existing feminist organizations or politics. And uh, um, whether that be and the longstanding perception that feminism um, is you know, something which is conceived of and often um, is a manifestation of a Eurocentric Western perspective. And, and I would not in any way 
uh, 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 say that those critiques are illegitimate as, you know, in some ways, as I've already been, been uh, saying, and that there's been, um, you know, a desire on the part of some people to work on women's issues while not be wanting to call themselves feminists. Um, uh, having said that, and I think that that what Abba and I have been saying this morning is, as there has been, though, greater acknowledgement that there isn't one form of feminism, but multiple feminisms, and that that uh, um, that there has been, and I think, especially coming from not, you know, okay, you, you have a point, but but especially coming from um, um, feminists themselves in South Asia, in Africa, in elsewhere, um, in in um, formulating their own sense of what, and for a very long time, not you know the last three decades, but but over a much longer period of time, um, I I think that that to some degree is is uh, um, less of a concern that it than it has been. Um, the other thing, and I just uh, what Abba was saying is that that uh, feminist organizations um, and and even so-called women's centers no longer it are not it no longer you know uh, places which uh, women alone are welcomed or services and other other things, but but women non-binary um, and and men are are welcomed, participate, et cetera. And and I think that that's a really uh, positive development alongside the the acknowledgement and as as uh, Abba said of of a whole variety of different of gender diverse identities um, intersecting with. Uh, a diverse sexual identities and other identities in a really positive, positive uh, way. Are there still challenges around inclusivity and diversity? Absolutely, but but even the acknowledgement of it as a process is something in which I, I think is is um, uh, something beneficial. So yeah, if, if that yeah, so that that's my response uh, uh, to that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I, I just want to weave it together, you know, and, and put my own bit in, in this. I think for me, you know, as, as a feminist who has worked with Indigenous women and Dalit women, and now that, that I founded the first one-stop crisis center in India, I my realization is that feminism is about the voice of the most dispossessed. And sometimes that most dispossessed can be can can need not be man or woman, because it also challenges that gender binary. Mm -hmm. But but the struggle is not to be the biggest victim. You know the struggle here yep. is not to be the biggest victim. But you know how do we ally? So feminism is an ideology which believes in socio-ecological justice. So you can have men, women, and people for with diverse identities on both sides, people who believe that it, it is an ideology and people who don't. And that's why, you know, I often get asked why are women patriarchal, you know, because they were not born given this training and theological hegemony is you know a Dalit person and untouchable was not trained at birth and that's why that person also believes that there is a hierarchy but you know thank you for raising this question and please feel free I know Nancy you have your hand up Nancy Ingram and I don't know if there's a system in which you can ask the question live but if you could please type it uh, then we'll certainly respond to it uh, and that brings me to the third question. Why you you both are from a very different range, you know? Abha, who has worked across South Asia, Nancy, you worked in Canada across. Uh, you're raising very, very similar things. Did, did you ever feel the need to ally? Because we're talking about transnational feminism now. And there have been efforts. What was your experience? Did you feel the need to ally? If you did, why? And at what level did you feel so? And I want to begin with Nancy this time. Um, I guess I would say, and I was involved in, this is where the scholarly part of me um, uh, uh, comes into this, is that I was part of a, a project um, 
in which looking at transnational networks um, and organizations historically. And as part of that, and, and the recognition of um, that, that uh, pertinent feminist issues don't stop at a particular border and that, that the acknowledgement that at sometimes national borders are part of the problem and limitation of, of uh, the impact of feminist uh, efforts is that, that working across borders is more important than, than um, ever uh, before. And that, that um, I think that, that um, the, having the kind of, and, and from my perspective and, and uh, within the context of being a feminist uh, within Canada, of you know calling for a degree of of uh, recognition and humility about what it means to be uh, a, a feminist uh, involved in transnational uh, efforts. And you know one of my messages these days is that uh, and while there's much greater uh, racial uh, and other forms of diversity within feminist organizations and movements uh, in Canada, um, there needs to be a much more meaningful reckoning with our own history of settler colonialism and forms of exclusion, which all of those things both impact uh, uh, the situation in Canada, but also greatly impact the ability of, of um, feminist organizations to work across borders and, and transnationally. And, you know, in, including, I, I'm just going to point to the, 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 the Cody situation, you know, that the difficulty for people to even come to Cody because of ongoing visa issues, because we have a system of immigration, which is still majorly into gatekeeping. And you know, at the same time, I'm conscious of the fact and uh, being a faculty member uh, um, who, you know, I, I don't face those kinds of restrictions when I want to visit globally and engage in, you know, various kinds of initiatives. So those things are really, I think, important and meaningful. Um, and let me think a little bit more. Uh, I'm sure that Abba can, can speak to this uh, more eloquently than I can, but that's that's how I would say that. That's a very, very well begun. Thank you, Nancy. Over to you, Abha. Nancy, first of all, you're not right. I cannot speak more eloquently than you. <laughs> we are just, I'm so glad, you know, that's one principle of feminism, the complementarity rather than competition, you know. So, yeah. so when we are talking, we are complementing each other because we're coming from very different contexts. And yet there is a language that's very common to us. Uh, just now, before I talk uh, about the transnational feminism, uh, we have just completed a signature campaign demanding lifting visa restriction to go across South Asian borders, particularly Pakistan. It, as our history, uh, these five countries were part of India, even part of Afghanistan at one time, one country, whether I want to call it India or not, that's uh, not relevant. Now, we have been, as feminist South Asian feminists, been dreaming of erasing these borders within our countries, that we should be able to freely move to each other because we belong. We belong to each other. That was our past, and that has to be our future. Uh, just dividing us, constantly keeping us apart, not allowing us to go to each other countries because we learn from each other. We have done South Asian courses month-long courses and have moved from country to country. And I cannot tell you what a powerful experience that is to live together for one month with each other from 13 different countries and building that solidarity action, crying together, laughing together, cracking jokes together and also building our common perspective. So for me, having worked in Afghanistan for a long time, having worked in Chaki, having worked in some of those, uh, in Sudan particularly, and what's going on in Sudan really breaks my heart. Uh, I personally feel there is such inspirational space 
across borders and a very important learning agenda that we need all the time to get get inspired and learn and critique our own strategies and our own political perspective and you know what's happening at the moment look what look, women in afghanistan are in spite of what's going on are able to do or are trying to do or what's happening in iran or ukraine and uh, you know these countries and their struggle and how even women in 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 <clears throat> Russia are rising and building solidarity across those two countries, conflict countries, and really the kind of kind of militarized power Russia is using against people, against humanity. I personally find it very important to read, to actually send solidarity action, uh, because we belong together. We belong to the Mother Earth. We belong to this entire cosmic kind of energy. And we need to save the Earth as well as human beings. So for me, as an eco-feminist, I also feel that the war and militarization and destruction is something as feminist I cannot accept and I will not ever propagate or support it. So our struggle, if we want to say demilitarization, we cannot do it in our respective countries. It has to be cross-border, uh, you know, alliance building, uh, if we want to really win, win our concerns. So I, I'm very, very clear that we have to be part of a much larger network. Uh, I was with an uh, African feminist in Doha recently, and I felt so inspired. I thought they were, they were far ahead of us in terms of strategizing, in terms of articulation, in terms of really what I call, you know, dodging the state. And kind of, <laughs> I loved it, you know, how do you do that? And we do it at times, you know, but they were too clever. And if we do not get these kind of opportunities, we are going to be poorer. We are going to be really not uh, what we want to become as, as I, I think, uh, international communities and international citizen, citizens of the Mother Earth. Amazing. Can I just make the, the quick point? Because yes, I, yes, I yes. love that, that phrase, Abba, dodging the state. I mean, one of the vulnerabilities about feminist organizations and feminist mobilization in Canada is how reliant we are on state funding is that, and what that has demonstrated is when you have a government, you know, that that sets a particular agenda, um, that that can really restrict what's possible at times because, because of that. Um, and when you have a change in government to one that might be centrist, which is what we have now to a more right-wing government, which we've had in the past and we might in the future, that greatly limits um uh yes and Julie Krause is saying and and funding from the provinces as well uh greatly you know it negatively impacted uh feminist organizations women's organizations and and feminist you know um uh mobilization and and it's something in in some ways that I don't think has really been reckoned with you know it's also let me just also say make the quick point that is, and people at, at Cody well know that there's the, the um, what is it called? The Feminist International Assistance Policy, right? Out of Global Affairs Canada. Um, and uh, part of the critique of that is, is and again, there's a whole, that there's a whole conversation happening with organizations that they're, they're uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, engaged with um, uh, internationally. But but why is it that we have a government that names a? It's the only I, that I can think of a fem. It, that's the one named feminist policy by our federal government. They don't name anything else that they do, at with any other organization like with you know ministries or et cetera. A feminist one. So I just only wanted to put in the little um, dodging the state is is actually. Um, not it's it can be a very useful strategy and from a canadian perspective um it, it, it can be really uh the reliance on state and state funding um uh, has been and and uh you know is a cautionary tale that that would be my point wow 
Thank you so well, much. I wasn't too frank on that, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy, for raising this particular one. And, and sometimes dodging the state can also lead you to be incarcerated, as has often happened. And uh, Abha is quite aware of it. But but I, I'm, I'm totally loving this uh, this inspirational space, you know, that, that you both are holding so well. You know, having been associated uh, with feminist movement for many decades, uh, would you have done anything differently now when you look back? And whoever wants to start can start. Oh. Uh I'm just thinking, yes, I think we needed to be very aware from the beginning about the uh, the exclusionary politics uh, of keeping people outside the frame of feminism that we did, to be honest. And therefore now a new learning has begun as the Dalit women's movement, the Muslim women's movement, the Christian women's movement, the sex workers uh, movement, transgender and particularly the movement, uh, women's movement uh, of women with dis disabilities or special abilities. And it has actually opened up a floodgate for, for us feminists who began many, many years back. Uh, to be honest, if we have now the possibility of, of acknowledging that we were not aware of the multiple vulnerabilities of groups of people at the time when we began. Yeah, we were women who began the feminist movement in the beginning from middle class and upper class background. We were educated. Many of us were from cities and we had academic qualification. I remember making a film on the entire politics of contraceptive that one of the rural women, the kind of protagonist in the film, she said, why do you keep telling us to go to literacy classes? And then she asked me, she looked at me and she said, okay, if I become literate, will I get the job that you have? And that's the challenge. Made me really kind of shrink and at this time acknowledge that she is really challenging me and that challenge, when it comes from working class women, from rural women, I personally feel that needs to be now accepted as a very important space to be challenged, to be not become reticent and not become comfortable with whatever we are doing. And uh, I feel that if I had to begin again, I would begin very differently with a different set of principles and awareness, very deep awareness of understanding that we are actually, we have multiple identities and many of our identities give us power and privilege and many of other identities give such, such serious vulnerabilities. And it is a combination of these identities that play out in, in the entire kind of a economics and politics and social formation. Um, we still need to understand it more deeply. We need to get closer, right? Really to, to a Dalit woman's life, you know, how she has been systematically uh, oppressed, not only oppressed, sexually abused, just because of her caste identity. And that access of landlords to these women is kind of given and accepted and has not been normalized. Now I'm seeing that they are raising their voices. If we had been aware of these, uh, these very, very culturally, socially kind of manufactured identities because of the system of oppression and exclusion, I think we would have made uh, the feminist movement a lot more inclusive. And the last thing that I want to say that the patriarchy is the only ideological kind of <clears throat> formation where women are made to actually propagate the church. No other system does it. So women are made a partner in actually saying patriarchy is important and we are the gatekeepers of patriarchy. And that's so evil on the part of patriarchal, patriarchal <laughs> lords and landlords who have 
given the task of continuation of patriarchy to women. And that's where our challenges kind of rises, that how do we take women out of that patriarchal mindset? Because not all women are feminist or, or challenging. The majority of women people we began were very patriarchal. They didn't realize that they were playing that role. I mean, I even talked to my father once. Why do you always kind of make my mother kind of tell me how should I be behaving? Why don't you talk to me directly? And that direct conversation is something that we are doing now. We are working with boys and we are talking to fathers that let's get together and create a festival of dialogue between the father and son, the mother and daughter. That's where I think we need to move on to bring peace as an agenda of this movement, you know, not peace only outside, but inside the home, because that has become the, the major site of violence against girls in India. In India, we are not even allowed to be born. But recently, one of the very interesting uh, journalists said that once they are born, they will go a long way. They are not going to give up. And I think that message made me feel, yes, because uh, these 100 years, 200 years of women's movement, or, uh, women's participation in the, uh, in the independent struggle, who were the architects of the women's movement in many ways for us, uh, they have created, all of us have contributed in creating a space for young women to rise and say, we will not accept it. Now, giving them the, giving them the tools to negotiate, to mediate, to say, I stand for myself and I will follow my dream. I really, you know, go along my dreams and I have a right to follow them. Thanks. Sorry for being long. Not at all. Not oh. at all, Abha. Very welcome. Nancy. Um, I, like, I, I, I agree with everything that, that, that uh, um, uh, Abba said. And um that it's hard to to think about you know there are many many oh now i have a cat showing up and it, it that that wants to participate as cats do um is that that um what i might have done differently um i i i let me pose it in this way is that um I, I wouldn't, and I, I think this is also in a different way what, what Abba was saying, but but um, um, I wouldn't care less. In some ways, I would care more, although how do you do that? I would, um, I, I wouldn't be less outspoken. I think that that was, uh, uh, has been important. Um, I would, I wouldn't care less uh, about the importance of educating several now for me and and you know I think that that one of the other things that we haven't talked about is the degree to which it's now possible for young people to be to have a feminist perspective incorporated into their education and to take that with them into whatever they do um and 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 that's been um really important what what I guess and and just because I really do, I, I, I agree completely with everything that Abba said. I, I would want to hold men more accountable. Like I, I'm just, at this particular stage, there's part of me that's just deeply frustrated by uh, um, the reticence of men to take responsibility for patriarchy, for their own sense of privilege. And in particular here, I'm talking you know, uh, white middle class educated men, but 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 more generally, that that um, uh, it, in my lifetime, you know, no significant um, improvements in it in a number of areas, and that something like gender based violence seemingly is as pervasive as it ever has been, and that much of the heavy lifting in raising these issues, in in bringing awareness, and doing all of you know, formulating any number of action plans, right? We have, have all kinds of action plans, but who's doing all that heavy lifting? It's it's permanently, it's uh, women and non-binary folk, it's not men. And uh, I, you know, I don't want to sound like an angry feminist mad at men, but but there is a part of me that would say, uh, uh, 
and I'm not, I don't have any easy answers on this, but holding men more accountable is something um, that, that I, I might do more differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that? Yeah. 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 It does. It does. I had a lot to say on that one, but, but both of you said, <laughs> but, 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 you Abba, know, I, you, I'm just interested what Abbott thinks about that. I agree with you. We should have held men more accountable and make them see what they are doing, not uh, not as a biological man, but as a social yes, gender. Yes, exactly. Gender, yeah. uh, you know, how they cannot get out of that grid of being a man, a manly man, you know, macho man. And I think there's a lot of pressure that patriarchy puts on them to be you know, the breadwinner, to be a man, strong, aggressive not cry. I think men have been victims of patriarchy as well, mm -hmm. uh, not in the same proportion, but definitely. And therefore, for them to change. And I think now men are becoming feminist. We have feminist men mm -hmm. around us, which we could have begun, as you said, much earlier, not only to hold them accountable, to say, look, you are not being treated yeah. in a way that you become a real human being rather than a, a kind of a cardboard image of a man, you know, and men are pushed into it from the since a childhood. Don't come back crying from your, you know, playground. Even if they lose their parents, they don't cry. They cry in the bathroom. I feel how sad. Why a man cannot be a cook in the house, you know, and look after the children. I've seen men, I mean, who have done it and they've done it with pleasure because they don't want to be out in a competitive world. But that uh, that allowing is not there in the family. You know, they are pushed, be an engineer, be a doctor, be a professional, you know, earn. And that pressure, and in India, culturally, they are the ones who are going to cremate you. They are the ones who are going to carry forward the name of the family. And that is a big burden on men as well. So I'm a bit sympathetic. <laughs> you know, not necessarily always angry, but at times when I see a woman burnt, and they come to her, she comes to us. I really get very, very angry. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the process of taking to Buddhism and I say, no, that doesn't help. But I cannot control that anger at that time when I see such atrocities. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I tend to agree. And Nancy, you don't sound like an angry feminist at all. You sound like somebody who's making a lot of sense except that she's, she's just saying what's on her mind. I also feel, you know, um, I was talking to Adam, who's a very good close colleague yesterday, day before yesterday. And, uh, you know, I was telling him that when the, the whole notion of public-private partnership came PPP, you know, I had these three words for men, which were like protectors of the family, providers for everyone, and performers in bed. And, you know, it takes a lot to live up to that that expectation and and you know how patriarchy also dehumanizes mm -hmm. men but makes them feel like they are on the upper pedestal right and and so while we we can have many women who have studied and not work but you know men who do not work as in productive work you know imagine how the the loss of respectability that happens with them but, but, you know, I, I love the fact that you both have looked at a very, very critically reflecting on how feminist movement has been. And, and, you know, it's not again that there is one single feminist movement. We just have three more minutes. And, uh, and you know, if, if you want, I, I see a lot of uh, comments in the chat box, which say that this has been a very deep discussion. I also feel it's been a very deep discussion. And uh, maybe we could come back one day for just a general chit chat with people, you know, when not, not necessarily in a webinar mode, but in a meeting mode, wherein everyone can just unmute and, and, and say what's on your mind and, and not think about getting judged. Um, but if we have a quick question now, we'll be very happy to take it. I don't know if we'll have time to respond though. Does anyone have any quick thoughts?
I, I, Abha, you are muted. I just wanted to uh, reiterate, you know, um, this, there is a documentary called Something Like a War about which Abha, you spoke. And uh, uh, when you Google it, you will find it. Uh, so, you know, it's about this doctor who has performed 100,000 um, uh, hysteric tommies in one day. And what that's not important, you know. And I know that Abha and Deepa who filmed it uh, go to this doctor saying, oh, you've got the Guinea's uh, record. Amazing. We want to film you. And then the doctor says, you know, what's not important that I did this operation. What's important is that I did not sully the women. So I did not have access to their vagina. And, you know, in the background, what you can see is how these women are moaning and crying and how they have been lined up like shuttle. So I, I, I would highly recommend that we watch this movie. I think you almost got beaten up later when you encountered the doctor. In, in Cairo, in the International Reproductive Health Conference. Uh, but you know what is interesting as a counter site that uh, all the women are sitting together and they are doing what we call the body mapping. And there's this vagina there, you know. So that was very interesting that he said I did did not expose them. And we said, we don't worry about getting exposed because that's part of our body. Just in the end, I want to say something that, you know, as we get defined and we define ourselves as leaders, as kind of directors of our institution, I personally found very difficult in the beginning to show my vulnerabilities. And that expectation of a person who is in a kind of a lead position is something that does injustice to women because we are not allowed to say, I'm as vulnerable as any other person, you know? And I personally find that feminist movement must work on this with, with women leaders from rural background, from uh, multiple identity uh, locations that we are not forced to be powerful, always in control situation. Yeah, our vulnerabilities are as important to share as our kind of uh, power or our capabilities. You know? So that's my last word. Nancy, do you have a last word? Um, just that, that to thank you um, for allowing me to be part of this conversation and that um, having this kind of space and with participants in the um, Cody program to to have the opportunity to meet Abba and um, I, I also agree with the, the issue of vulnerability and also even the recognition um, of a, a different kind of vulnerability that being a feminist isn't always easy you know in that that in terms of critiques in terms of uh, other things and and it, it takes a certain degree of fortitude and <laughs> to to continue on that path. But but I think that that for someone I just I I I look at Abba who, for whom it's been a life's work, and for me it's almost a life's work in that I'm you know um, is that that I, I I hope that I've been able to uh, convey the significance and importance and life affirming part of that. Thank you so much, Nancy and so Sarika, for bringing us together for this conversation. Sometimes it happens very spontaneously, and what you have written kind of you put it aside. So it was nice to answer the question the way you think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Special thanks to Nancy and Ava for being able to come. We're going to keep this dialogue open. So please don't feel that this is the end of this, this particular conversation. Feel free to write to any of us. And, and you know, we, we could actually have do it monthly. We could come back and talk about it. And, and the way the two of you spoke, it was very, very inspirational space. For folks who are watching on what's going on in the Feminist Leadership Series, please uh, keep looking. We'll have another one around LGBTQ with Noor, who's from Indonesia, and, and she works a lot with, with women and organizes courts, something similar to the courts that Abha was talking about. 
and uh, Arvind Narayan, who is a lawyer who's leading the case and which led to the decriminalization of same-sex uh, relationships in India. So the two of you will then will talk from a very, very different perspective, but it will be a very interesting conversation. Thank you, everyone, and uh, see you around. Namaste. Get well, Sarika. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy.